before the cells of our body, such as liver cells or skeletal muscle cells, can actually use their supply of glucose, they have to release the glucose from glycogen. Because inside our body, we store glucose in the form we call glycogen. So the question that I'd like to address in this lecture is, how exactly do we break down glycogen inside the cells of our body? Well, glycogen breakdown, also known as glycogen degradation, is the process by which we carry out three different steps to basically release the glucose molecule from glycogen. And this process actually involves four different enzymes, as we'll see in just a moment. So let's discuss the first step of glycogen breakdown. Now, the first step is known as phosphorolysis, and this process is catalyzed by an enzyme known as glycogen phosphorylase. Now, glycogen phosphorylase uses an orthophosphate molecule to actually cleave, to break an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond between a terminal glucose molecule that contains a free hydroxyl group on the fourth carbon and the Jason glucose molecule. And this can be seen in the following picture. So we essentially have our first step of glycogen breakdown. So on the left side, we have the reactant, the glycogen molecule that contains, let's suppose, n number of glucose molecules. And to simplify the diagram, I've only drawn two of these glucose molecules. Now, this is the terminal glucose molecule that contains the free hydroxyl group on carbon number four of the glucose. And so this is the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond that will be cleaved by the glycogen phosphorylase. Now the other reactant of this particular reaction is the orthophosphate. The orthophosphate actually acts as the nucleophile that cleaves this alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond to basically form these two product molecules. We have a glucose 1-phosphate and we have the glycogen that now contains one less glucose because we removed this terminal glucose molecule here. Now we have this glycogen that contains and minus one number of glucose molecules. Now, inside the cells of our body, this reaction is a product favored reaction. And that's because of two important reasons. Number one is this reaction is energetically favorable. Why? Well, recall that if we want to transform glucose into glucose 1-phosphate, we actually have to utilize and hydrolyze an ATP molecule. So normally, if we want to transform glucose into glucose 1-phosphate, we have to use an ATP molecule. But let's see what happens in this particular reaction. In this reaction, we do release a glucose molecule. We take off the terminal glucose. In the process, we add a phosphoryl group without actually hydrolyzing an ATP molecule. And this creates an energetically favorable process. So we essentially bypass the process of using an ATP molecule by releasing the glucose in the glucose 1-phosphate form. Now, the other reason why this reaction is product favorite is because inside our cells, we generally have a much higher concentration of the orthophosphate reactant molecule than the glucose one phosphate product. In fact, the ratio of orthophosphate to this product is about 100 to 1. And so because of that, because we have so much more of the reactants, that means that will drive this reaction toward the right side. So, this process, step one, of glycogen breakdown proceeds toward the right side, toward the product side, because the cell contains a higher concentration of orthophosphate compared to glucose 1-phosphate, and because the formation of glucose 1-phosphate bypasses the usage of the ATP, it forms directly the glucose 1-phosphate from that glucose, and this is, in fact, energetically favorable. Now let's move on to step number two. So in step number two, what we ultimately want to do is, oh, and by the way, the glucose 1-phosphate that we form as a product in step one will actually be used in step three. But the glycogen N-1 is actually used in step two. 
And what step two does is it restructures, it remodels this glycogen. It basically puts it into form so that the glycogen phosphorylase can continue acting on it, cleaving it and releasing the glucose once, uh, one phosphate molecule. So the reason for that is simple. The glycogen phosphorylase is limited to what it can actually do. The glycogen phosphorylase can only cleave alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds. It cannot cleave alpha-1-6 glycosidic bonds. In fact, it stops cleaving the alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds for residues, for glucose molecules away from the branching point, the nearest one, the nearest alpha-1-6 glycosidic bond. So, glycogen phosphorylase, the enzyme that catalyzes step one of glycogen breakdown, can only cleave alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds. It does not cleave alpha-1-6 glycosidic bonds that are found in glycogen. In fact, this enzyme stops four residues away from the nearest branching point. And we'll talk more about that in this particular diagram. Now, Step number two can actually be broken down into two different steps, and that's because step number two utilizes two different types of enzymes. One of these enzymes is known as transferase, and the other enzyme is known as alpha-1,6 glucosidase. Now, in eukaryotic cells, these two enzymes are actually found on a single enzyme. So, in eukaryotic cells, we have this single bifunctional enzyme that contains these two different types of enzymes, transferase and alpha-1,6 glucosidase these two different types of catalytic sites that basically catalyze two different types of reactions. So let's begin by examining transferase and what it actually does. So let's suppose we have the following glycogen molecule. So it's a simple molecule with a single alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. So th these bonds here are the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, and these bond here, and this bond here is the alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Now remember what I said about glycogen phosphorylase. It can only cleave alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, and it stops cleaving the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds when it gets to four residues away from the nearest branching point, the nearest alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. So on this particular section, we have one, two, three, four glucose residues, and so the glycogen phosphorylase will no longer be able to cleave these alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds because it's only four away from this branching point. And so to fix that problem, what transferase does is it takes this region of three residues away from this section and moves it, shifts it onto, onto this region here. So it basically forms the following product. So it removes this and extends this linear section by three glucose molecules. So transferase catalyzes the shift of three glucose residues from one branch, this branch, to the other branch, this branch here. And this process basically leaves a single glucose molecule that is attached to this entire region by an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Now, this is where alpha-1,6 uh, glucosidase actually comes into place, uh, comes into play. Because what this enzyme does is, it is able to cleave that alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. So, the alpha-1,6 glucosidase cleaves this alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond and releases this free glucose. And that free glucose is then transformed by hexokinase to form the glucose 1-phosphate, which then goes on to step 3, as we'll see in just a moment. And we also form this product. Now, notice that when we go from this, pro uh, to, uh, from this molecule to this molecule, we essentially remove the branching points. We basically transform the branched polymer of glycogen to a linear polymer of glycogen. And now this only contains the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds that can be cleaved by glycogen phosphorylase. And so once we form this linear glycogen in step two, the glycogen phosphorylase 
moves on to this glycogen and begins breaking uh, these alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds and those glucose 1-phosphate molecules produced then go on to step 3. And so let's move on to step 3 and let's see what happens in step 3. Now in step 3, we basically transform the glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate. The reason we need to do that is because the glucose 6-phosphate can go on to basically react in different types of pathways. For instance, in skeleton muscle cells, the glucose 6-phosphate can undergo glycolysis to form ATP. In liver cells, the glucose 6-phosphate can be transformed into glucose and then released into the blood to help regulate the blood plasma, uh, the, blo uh, the glucose blood plasma concentration, and so forth. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes step 3 is phosphoglucomutase. Remember that a mutase basically transfers a group from one location to a different location on that same molecule. So, what phosphoglucomutase actually does is it transfers that phosphoryl group from carbon number 1 to carbon number 6. Now, we begin with glucose 1-phosphate and we end with glucose 6-phosphate. But what we actually don't show in this diagram is that we actually have an intermediate molecule involved. And that intermediate molecule is glucose 1,6-bisphosphate. So if we examine the active site of this enzyme phosphoglucomutase, we're going to see a modified serine residue. And that serine residue actually plays the catalytic role of catalyzing this reaction. So inside the active site of this enzyme, we have a serine serine that has been modified, we attached a phosphoryl group onto that serine. So before this reaction actually begins, that serine contains a phosphoryl group. And so when this reaction takes place, that phosphoryl group is transferred from the serine residue onto carbon-6 of this glucose, forming that glucose 1,6-bisphosphate intermediate. Now, in the next step of this process, this phosphoryl group is transferred from carbon 1 onto, so from carbon 1 of the glucose 1,6-bisphosphate onto that serine residue. And what that does is it regenerates the active site of this phosphoglucomutase enzyme and it forms that glucose 6-phosphate. So we see that glycogen breakdown and glycogen degradation consists of three major steps and involves four major enzymes. In step one, the entire goal is to release that glucose in the glucose 1-phosphate form. In step two, the entire goal is to remodel, restructure that glycogen so that the glycogen phosphorylase can actually continue breaking down the glycogen and releasing those glucose 1-phosphate molecules. And in step three, the entire goal is to transform all those glucose 1-phosphate molecules into a form, namely glucose 6 phosphate that can that can then go on and carry out some type of particular process in liver cells the process is regulating blood glucose levels in skeleton muscle cells the process is generating atp via glycolysis